This morning we're going to the Word of God to Matthew chapter 7 or chapter 5 and then over to chapter 7 and uh, we're going to be looking today at the foundations of discipleship. What does the what does discipleship really look like? Remember we want to learn and to live from Jesus. So this morning as we open our passage we're going to the Beatitudes of course. We're going to talk about a visionary disciple. What is a visionary disciple? Well, it's important for us to understand we've talked about meat disciples and comforted disciples and kingdom disciples, and we've gone through all these different words that describe a disciple, and Jesus gives them to us in what we call the Beatitudes. But I think the word visionary we need to stop and talk about before we ever go any further. Because most of you and I have been manipulated by the word vision or visionary. How many of you have ever grown up in church where people said we need to get a vision to build the church? We need to get a vision to win people. We need to get a vision to do this and a vision to do that. And so when you say the word vision in church, everybody locks in like laser beams going, this is what they're talking about. So let's say it together. This is not what we're talking about. You ready? Let's say it together. This is not what we're talking about. We're talking about a vision that's different. A visionary disciple has a different approach and a different way. And so notice what Jesus said. Let's go to the text. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, Jesus again uses the word blessed, which means highly favored. He said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now, let's talk all about this verse for a moment. Spend some time here. First of all, he says, highly favored are those who have a pure heart. And the word pure heart means guiltless. Levi picked the perfect song this morning. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. There is no way you and I can get pure outside the blood of Jesus. And we all said, well, all of us didn't say that. Let's try that again. And we all said, amen. amen. Today's going to be a participating day, okay? So get ready. Now, what I want you to grab a hold of is that if you and I have this this pure heart, this guiltless heart, how does that come? Well, Jesus is talking about our motives here. Why I do what I do. And so, in order for me to visually, and that's what it means, clearly see God, it doesn't mean that one day I'll see God. I've heard people preach that, and that's not what Jesus says here. It's totally out of context of everything else. What Jesus is saying here, blessed is the disciple whose heart and motives are pure, and they see God. And when you see God, you see where God is at work. And you know what God wants to do. For when you see the Lord, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You see the surrounding work of what God is doing, who he is and what he does. And so today, we're told by our Lord to be a visionary disciple, to be pure in heart, to have this motive to want to see where God is at around us and see God in our lives. See, everybody's praying, I want to have a vision and see Jesus. No, well, God says, have a vision and follow Jesus and learn where Jesus is at work around you. And today, the beautiful thing is, God is at work all around us. The problem is, we're not able to have the right motives to see where God is at work. So we live a blinded spiritual life, playing the church game, doing the religious stuff, but failing to really get where God is at work among us. Now, one, one, we're going to pull the ladder out now, and I want you to think about this ladder in the definition of a visionary disciple. All right, come on up here, John Mark. John Mark is going to be so limber when we get done with this, right? 
No, uh, not yet. So when John Mark gets between the me ladder and the Jesus ladder, and this has been a, a, a real illustration for us to look at, because somehow you and I need to understand we don't balance our lives well. We, we, we have to have one Lord. It's either self and money, like Jesus said a couple weeks ago, or it's him. It can't be both. And see, most of us have tried to live in a what world? A both world, and it doesn't work because it's directly commanded against the scriptures. Now, go up to the next line there. All of a sudden, we understand that John Mark's got to do something different. So if you're a visionary disciple and you really want to see Jesus, see God, what do you have to do here? What does John Mark need to do if this ladder symbolizes Jesus and this symbolizes himself Right now, which way is he looking? Off the direction. He can look at both, or he can look with his back to it, right? But he's trying to balance it. But in order to really see Jesus, what's he got to do? Go ahead and turn, if you would. John Mark, if you really want to see Jesus, what do you got to do? That's exactly right. You got to leave the me completely behind. There can be no me motive. Are you with me? It can't be so people say, boy, he really loves souls and he's winning people to Jesus. Or he's a good man or she's a good woman or they, whatever those spiritual legacies we want to leave. We have to let the Lord give us our legacy. And what we have to do is keep our eyes on who? Jesus with pure motives. You can even be looking for Jesus and have the wrong motive about it. So, today, thank you, John Mark. Just remember that as you go forth. Thank you, Levi. You were not on a bathroom break this week. That's good. Um, well, he didn't even bring my TV back. I made him mad already. All right. When you think about what Jesus says, let's turn over to Matthew chapter 7, where Jesus unpacks this visionary disciple. And when Jesus unpacks it, he unpacks it with a unique word. Now, he uses two words, but we'll use one. And it's the word don't. Notice that he says in chapter 7, verse 6, Jesus said, do not give dogs what is holy. Then he says, do not throw your pearls before pigs. Don't give dogs holy things. Don't. Throw the most valuable thing before the pigs. Lest they trample them under feet and turn to attack you. Now, when you think about this text, Jesus says, do not, which is the word for don't. The phrase, don't. Don't. Anybody ever heard that word? Don't. Right? When you say don't, what did you mean? Don't do it, right? But somehow we got this idea that if it feels good or we like it or it's okay, then we can go ahead and do it and God will bless it. As I shared with a group of pastors yesterday, one of the great dangers we have is we do things and ask God to bless it instead of finding where God is at work and just join him because he will then bless that. But see, we want to do what we want to do. Now, notice what happens here. He says the standard is holy things, which the word holy here, pure in heart, a pure means sacred. Jesus said don't take that pure heart that you have. Don't take that holy, sacred gospel truth of the word of God, all the holiness that you have, don't take that and give it to dogs. Now, in that day, dogs and pigs were the most hated animals in that period of time. Now, in that day, they didn't have little house dogs that barked. Most of the dogs were what? Scavengers. They were known for attacking people and children. And pigs were against the Jewish culture. And so when the people saw a pig farmer, they did not think well of them. They thought bad of them. And they saw pigs as nasty, horrible, stinking animals. 
Now, it's interesting, my view of a pig from the time I was five or six years old to my view of a pig at 62. See, as a kid, I viewed the pig from the outside in. We used to kill hogs where I grew up in my mama's store. We'd go out in the farm and kill them, bring them in, butcher them. And I, I, I wasn't real pressed with hog meat when I was a kid. Now, I look from the inside out. Bacon, ham, pork chops, right? Everybody with me? Ribs? Now you're hungry. Now I've lost everybody for the rest of the day. You see, he says, don't give cause. Don't give a reason for a dog to receive holy, sacred, pure things. Don't. Don't. Now, he goes on and says, rem let's remember what Paul Peter said. Peter said apostates were dogs. So, you and I, as God's children, this thing's wearing me out, moving up and down. What am I rubbing against, Andy? Um, it, it, it really gives us this idea that we are uh, we're taking that which is sacred and that which is holy and just turning it to garbage. Now, it's not talking about worldliness. It's talking about when you and I go out and talk to others about Jesus, really. Jesus is saying, when you and I are out there in this world, don't turn your motives to, uh, to dogs and to pigs and let them all of a sudden trample everything about you. Notice, notice what he says. You don't, the struggle is this. You've got to share the gospel. You've got to tell the gospel. We've been commanded to give the gospel, but we've also been told by Jesus, don't. Don't waste it on dogs and pigs. So what does that mean? We say, well, everybody's going to hell and there's no use sharing the gospel. No. Or that group out there will never come to God. That is not true. What is true is that not everybody at all time is ready to receive the gospel. There's time and place when people are hungry for truth. So it is our motive to share with those who are ready to either let us plant the seed, water the seed, or see the harvest and let God give the increase. But what we cannot do is do what a lot of people do in salesmanship evangelism. What is salesmanship evangelism? Well, do you know why this world hates the church so much? Because we have taken a holy, spiritual thing, the gospel, and thrown it to dogs and pigs, and it's been trampled upon right now. Because the church tried a salesmanship evangelism. Now, let, let me just borrow your minds. We don't have any car salesmen here today. What do you do when you go to get your car fixed at the local uh, car lot? You pull up at a Chevrolet or Ford or whatever, and you want to, you, the other day I had to go get the key fog fixed on our car, and when I pulled up, before I ever opened my door, what did I have standing there? A salesman. And he was very nice, very helpful, and um, very disappointed that I wasn't here to buy a car. So while they were doing it, I just, getting everything ready, I walked out just to look at the prices of cars. Guess who joined me? Another one. That's a nice car. You need that car. I said, no, I don't need that car. He said, oh, you'd look good in that car. I said, buddy, look at me. I'm old. I don't look good in anything. <laughs> he said, man, you're a hard sell. I said, no, I'm a no sell. You understand? A no sell. See, what he was doing, he thought he was tearing down the wall, and what was I doing? I was building the wall. That happens with people who go out and just throw Jesus everywhere. 
And, and that's what's going on in so much of our culture because God is at work, but we're letting them trample over it. Jesus said, don't. You may like doing that. You may feel really good when you throw Jesus everywhere, but it's not helping the cause. It's being disobedient. Don't. We've been called to preach the gospel everywhere. Don't means you disobey him instead of pleasing him. You see, the test in when I talk to people about Jesus is this. If I get a negative response, I back off. If I get a positive response, I go further. But I never go beyond where that person is ready. Because if you do, you're playing God. Because what does the scripture tell us? The Lord must what? Draw them. Conviction is a part of God's plan. You see, using sacred things to people who haven't responded to the Lord is like the dog who's considered God's enemy. And our culture turns away truth. Our culture turns away the fact. You see, if you're witnessing and building the wall, you're not helping the cause. You're what? You're hurting. And there's a lot of hurting calls out there. And so, but wait a minute. I thought we had to share the gospel. We do. Don't ever mistake what I say. I, when you preach this way, people take it and run the wrong direction because we want to do it the way we like to do it. That's not what Jesus says. Jesus says, don't take righteous things and let them get trampled and let them get fed over. But you got to be careful about quoting Scripture. I'm, I don't mind mentioning his name. He's Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson. Said to me on a phone call one day, he said, Tim, I want to tell you something. Quit quoting Scripture all the time. There's a place for it, and he does it. He does it well. He said, when the opportunity comes, you give it, but also learn to argue on their level because they don't understand our level. That was very valuable to me. Because you see, people who are lost may even have spiritual questions, but if you start down the religious trail as they see it, they lose sight. They want to know you love them before they are willing to talk. See, people really don't care what... People don't care to hear you unless they know you care about them. And so here's what we need to do. First of all, how do I witness? Well, the first thing to witnessing is not going out with my tracks. You know, we don't have tracks here at the Grove anymore because tracks turn into litter. Did you all know that? When you leave a track in a bathroom thinking you're winning somebody to Jesus, you just littered some poor guy working's bathroom, right? You know, I was walking in this restaurant not long ago, and a guy was passing out tracks. He was trying to give me a track. I said, I don't want your track. He said, uh, I just want to tell you about Jesus. I said, I know Jesus. He said, well, then why don't you want my track? I said, well, if I, that track is for somebody that doesn't know Jesus. I know Jesus. He said, but I don't know that you know Jesus. I said, you're not my judge. I said, you know, the Bible says, don't you? He goes, no, what? I said, the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Have you done that? He said, I wouldn't be out here if I wasn't. I said, that's not true. There are a lot of hypocrites. He said, you're a smart aleck. I said, No. I was going in a restaurant to eat a meal. I didn't want to be bothered by you. Somebody said, well, he was just trying to tell people about Jesus. No, he was out there doing self-motivating stuff. He will not see God that way. God would have told him, Tim York saved, let him go on through the door. Right? See, that's the point we miss. That we're to pray for the opportunity. We're to ask God for leadership. If you don't know God is working, you simply share a word, but don't push the point. And whatever you do, please don't give people the Jesus jab. What is that? Well, if you had Jesus, this wouldn't happen. That's not true. 
If you had Jesus, this, that's not true. What you and I have to understand is it rains on the just and the unjust and getting saved is not a magical wand that rids all your problems. It is a new relationship, a new heavenly home. It's all those wonderful things that are described in scripture, but you and I use them in the wrong way. Second of all, instead of asking questions and making statements, let them talk to you about spiritual things. What do you mean? Just talk to people. Best interest? Are you a Christian? Well, everybody's Christian today. Are you saved? Well, there's a house on fire. Didn't know where to get. People don't understand this terminology. What we have to learn is you have to invest in people by loving and caring, doing acts of kindness. You can't be the community smart aleck and then be able to win people to Christ. What we have to learn to do is walk spiritual journeys and learn to talk with people and learn to spend time with people. And when they began to ask the spiritual questions, you began to answer them like Jesus did. Jesus allowed people to ask him questions. Not the Pharisees. He nailed their hide every chance he got. But he did not do that to the common people who were hurting and who needed him. He answered their questions. He talked to them and let people ask you the spiritual question. You said, they won't ask me if you prayed and you're going to the people that are seeking right then, and God is at work, God will open those doors. See, it's not about what you and I do. It's being available for his service. But by the way, you can't do that sitting at home. You can't do that on a computer or an iPhone. You got to be among people. Now, the third thing. Once they share their issue with you, don't pull out your Romans road. Talk to them. Walk them through. If God opens the door, you move forward. But don't kick the door open. 43 years ago, I was over in Woodbine area, doing door knocking with an old deacon. And a woman went to shut the door on us, and he stuck his toe in that door so she couldn't shut it. Well, she pulled a gun. She was going to shut her door. And I think it's important for us to understand that people are going to shut their door. And so what we have to be willing to do is move forward if it happens. Now, here's what I want you to also understand. Don't invite them to church. Don't the first thing you do is invite somebody to come to church. I want you to invite people to church. I want you to be a part. I want church to be a part of your life. And I want all those wonderful things. But that's not the beginning. That's toward the end. Learning to disciple people to repentance and have an authentic change in their spiritual journey makes all the difference in the world. I've been amazed over the years about how people often think inviting the church is evangelism. It's not. It's, it's building the church. It's getting people, but it's not evangelism. Evangelism is when you and I disciple people to a place that they can accept Jesus and a place where they have the information they understand. I, I would suggest this. If somebody's asking you spiritual questions, call me after you've talked to them. Begin a, a Bible study of some kind, a discovery Bible study, something like that with them, and begin to let them answer the questions and ask the questions and walk them through it instead of trying to kick the barn door down and try to get somebody here to get them saved. We need to win people and we need to reach people and we need a lot more of that in our church. I'm going to be honest. We need more of you out there sharing the gospel, 
sharing the truth, but it's got to be done in a spiritual way. See, you are intimidated because we've been taught to do it the car salesman way. We need to do it the biblical way. And begin to reach and touch lives. And see, God changed people. So what's the word? Don't. There's times when you don't throw sacred things to dogs. Or you don't throw pearl, valuable things to pigs that trample. And the word trump means heavy, roughly over top of them. And they trump them down and they beat them down and they are of no value. And then they turn and attack you. They bite you. You ever seen a mad hog? He's a vicious dude. And today our culture is viciously stomping and treading over everything that is sacred. And it's not their fault, it's our fault because we did not do it the right way. Many of your family's that way. Many of your friends are that way. They trample over that which is spiritual and they're rough and they're nasty and they're heavy on it and they do all kinds. Why? Because it's not, they've not been treated right. We must let God do the work and we join him in the work. I wanted to show the clip, but I wasn't sure it'd be legal. Facebook has a lot of rules on us these days. But there's an old Bob Newhart. Anybody remember that show when he was a psychiatrist or psychologist? He did the counseling. And there's a clip where, probably the only one I ever remember of. A woman walks in, he sits down at the desk, she sits across, and she tells him her problem. He said, I'm going to give you two words to help you with that. Write them down. He said, you really don't need to write them down, you need to remember them. Stop it. She explains that she can't stop because he goes, stop it. And finally before it's over, he's just yelling, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it. Don't you think God sometimes does that? Don't. But I want to do it. I just got to do it. I feel it. I know it's your flesh. There's a difference between feeling what the flesh wants to do and what the power and majesty and glory of the Spirit of God does. Let's move on to the next passage. Brother Wade read this to us. Not only should we don't, but there's a doing. How do I win and reach people? How do I know when God is at work? How do I, well, he tells us in verse 7. He tells us, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. Notice the doing. The doing here, Jesus taught his disciples how to pray in Matthew chapter 6. Remember the Lord's Prayer? Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. What was verse 10 say? Say it with me out loud. Thy kingdom come. Come on, say it out loud. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in Wow. That's the prayer. That's the doing. You see, he readdressed his prayer this time to tell us that we're to have a certain kind of prayer. See, most people want to pray that this, verse 7 through 11, is the purpose of prayer. If I keep seeking, if I keep knocking, if I keep asking, God will finally do what I want done. Are you with me? That's not what Jesus taught us in verse 10 of chapter 6. Thy kingdom come, what happens? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, listen, Jesus wants you to pray persistently. Now, the word for, notice what he said, for everyone that asks receives and everyone who seeks finds and everyone who knocks, it will be open. Now, the false narrative here is that if I remain persistent, I can change God's mind. 
And he'll go from his will to my will. You ever see a kid in the grocery store? I want it. Tell me I want it. I want it. And some parents will finally do what? Here. They'll shut you up. And people have that picture of God. Yeah. Keep begging, God will do it. No, 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 no. He tells us he won't do it in the later verses. See, persistence is taught in the text in, the pre in, in a present tense form. In other words, Jesus says, you and I are to keep asking, we're to keep seeking, and we're to keep knocking. And the word ask, somebody else did the acrostic there, I just borrowed it. it says, you keep asking, you keep seeking, and you keep knocking. What are we asking for? What are we seeking for? What are we knocking for? And if I were to ask that in a small group, you all would say what? What I want, right? Is that true? Yeah, it's true. You don't have to ask spiritual, we're in church. But what are we supposed to be praying for? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on as it is in heaven. See, my seeking, my asking, my seeking, and my knocking isn't for me. It's for a purpose. Verse 9 said, of which of you, if a son asked him for a bread, would give him a stone, or if he asked for a fish, would give him a serpent? I mean, how many of you would give your kid a snake? You ought to be put in jail for child abuse if you hand out snakes. But notice what he said. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more shall your, will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? What's the purpose of prayer? When you and I pray, we're asking for bread and not a stone. We're asking for a fish and not a snake. Note the bread and the fish are what? They're my needs. I need the food. The child needs the food the father gives him. See, our need is not to have what we all think we're wanting because the truth is, if God gave you what you prayed for, you'd be in a mess right now. I mean, I think about when Phyllis was a teenager, she probably prayed for her husband. She prayed for guys that she'd be in a mess, right? but now she's got the perfect man, right? You're not still asking, seeking, and look knocking, are you? But anyway, <laughs> you see, you never know. That's true. Well, better get to the evil part then. But anyway, you see, when you and I are looking for the purpose, we're not looking for our will, we're looking for God's will. And it's a different world. See, remember, God's will doesn't always get done on earth. And remember, we talked about that. Please don't read into that. Please don't twist that. When somebody said, well, it's God's, it must have been God's will. No, human beings made choices that were against God's will. God did not will that that little girl died in Georgia this week. It was not God's will. That was a man's will that disobeyed God. Murder is never in God's plan. But what you and I have to understand is that's true in our lives too. And so what happens is the father says we're evil. Yeah. Can you and I be praying evil? Yes. I asked one time here at the church a few years ago, I said, I got something I told him what was, I want you to pray about. I got up and I made the announcement of how the thing had gone and s several people walked up to me afterwards and go, boy, that's the way I was praying. I'm thinking, that's not prayer. You were bossing God, bullying God around. That's not how you pray. You don't pray for your will, your direction. Your, you pray for what? God's will. That you and I can get there. 
that we can do God's will. It's not that he'll magically do this stuff. It's that you and I can get to where we sense. Somebody said, well, back, remember back when we we're supposed to be planting seeds and sharing the gospel? Somebody said, well, how do I know? How will I ever know if I don't, don't preach to them about Jesus? I'll tell you how you'll know. God will put you together at the right moment, the right time, the right place, and God will give you that opportunity if you're asking, seeking, and knocking. Persistence with a purpose. See, everything in my life I need to pray about. I, I, Paul taught us to pray in the Spirit. And so as I'm being led by the Spirit of God, I need to allow prayer. I need to allow God witnessing. I need to allow giving. I need to allow fasting. Whatever those things are, I need to let God and God alone Bring direction there. And so it's important for us to understand doing, being persistent, being persistent in my prayer life, being persistent, searching for God's will as I witness, being persistent. You say, well, I tried it one time, it didn't work. No, being persistent. Keep praying, keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. Let me tell you something. Some of you may have never, ever, 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 ever won anybody to Jesus. You know why? You quit praying. You quit asking. You quit seeking. You quit knocking. There are all kinds of people out there. But the problem is, we want God just to hand it to us. That's not how it works. We've got to be doing it. Hallie Joe and I have started a tradition it's a wonderful tradition. We eat chocolate Hershey bars together. And uh, she'll walk up to me, I'll be sitting in my chair, and she'll look at me and go, now what that means to everybody else, she's hungry. For me, chocolate bar. And so, I could feed her chocolate bars 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Would that be good for her? And if I gave her what she asked for, what would I give her every time she asked for it? Chocolate bar. If God gave you everything you asked for, you'd be in real trouble right now. So what we have to do is persistently be asking, seeking, and knocking to find God's direction. So what I don't do is do my own thing and cast pearl before swine. What I'm doing is I'm seeking, I'm knocking as a visionary missionary, a missionary uh, person, mission, on mission for God out there in the world. I'm visionary what I'm doing. And then I do. What did he say in verse 12? Verse 12 said, for whatever you wish the others would do to you, do also to them. And this is the law and the prophets. Now, I got to tell you, the golden rule, right? Another one of the most misused verses in all the Bible. Because you get to beat people up with it. You see, the, the fact is, the word so in verse 7, or therefore in some of your translations, refers back to verse 7 through 11. So if you and I are to don't do something and we are doing something, then we ought to do something. We should treat people in a way that we want to be treated. Let me ask you this. Do you like to be embarrassed? So why would you embarrass an unsaved person by the way, do you like to be harassed? No. Why do you harass unsaved people? Oh, oh, do you like to have people make off-the-wall statements at you? So why do we do that to people? Do you like for people to tell you something to do that you don't even understand? No. Then why do we do that to people? Because we think they have the concept to process it, and they don't. You see... What are the differences? There's a difference between 
what we are doing and our desires. If your desire is to do the right thing, then your motive is to see God and see where God is at work. And if God's working that person's life. See, this is not a society rule. This is not a rule that we should have in culture. I think you go back and pull up a New York Times report that I'm actually quoted using this verse out of context, and I regret that. Where I actually said we ought to practice this verse in the society. It's not with the society. This is a disciple verse. It's not a civility verse. The disciple verse is that you and I go do the right things. Not to hurt people, but to help. Our doing is to bless. We're salt and light. We're not the aggravator of the community. Jesus said you do it from the law and the prophets too. How do you do that? Well, to do good means you don't covet. To do good means you don't steal. To do good means you don't bear false witness. To do good means you don't murder. To do good means what? You don't commit adultery. To do good, you obey your parents. To do good is to do unto others you have them do unto you. So what are we supposed to do? to do good. See, sometimes we know what we're supposed to do, but we listen to somebody else. Is that true? When I read this study this week, I couldn't help but think about Juan. Juan was a little boy who knew Spanish and English on my baseball team. Juan was fast as Grease Lightning. But I hated him being on base because he wouldn't listen to me. He'd be on third base. I'd look at him and I'd say, Juan, get a lead. Get about three feet off. And when that catcher misses that ball, I want you to run home, I want you to slide, and I want you to score. Ready? Ready. So I'm standing on third base, coach's box. Juan gets his lead. I'm watching the pitcher in case he comes after Juan. Pitcher throws the ball, catcher misses the ball. But at that moment, I hear a voice in Spanish from the bleachers behind me. And Juan's still standing on third base. I said, Juan, what are you doing? I told you to go. But my mom told me to stay. I said, I'm the coach. He said, yeah, but I got to go home with her. So I go up and talk to mom. I said, mom, don't do that. She said, I don't want him to get out. I said, I know. I want him to score. See, sometimes, let me get this straight because it won't sound stupid if it doesn't. Probably will anyway, but anyway, that's good for me. We don't do what we ought to do. And we do, we do what we're told to don't do. You get that? And that's the problem. A visionary disciple is looking for Jesus with a pure heart, with a desire to make an impact. Remember, Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. Remember that? You remember John, when he saw Jesus, said, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. A few weeks ago, Andy preached and closed with Stephen seeing Jesus at the right hand of the Father. You and I need to see God every day and every hour of our lives in every aspect of If you check the box and go to church and check the box you read your Bible and check the box that you pray and check the box that you, you're not going to get here. You're not doing. You're doing, but you're doing what you want to do. But when you do it 
out of asking, seeking, and knocking. Then all of a sudden, you see where God is working. And it forever changes your life. I wasn't going to share this, but I will. We used to do Thursday night visitation when we were pastoring in Kentucky. And uh, I've told this here before. One Thursday night, Phyllis and I was out visiting. We'd been everywhere, and nobody was home. And I told her, I said, uh, I just sense we need to go back to Don's house. And she looked at me, and she's right. She said, Tim, we was there last week, and he didn't even want us there. I said, I know, but I sense I need to go there. And so we drive over. She's not real happy about getting out of the car, and I get it. We did not get a warm welcome last Thursday. And you never go back to the same house two weeks in a row. And I knock on the door, and Donnie, his wife, answers the door, and she's as shocked as anything that we're there. And so Donna was a smart wife. She just would there let us go meet with Don, and she'd take off to the kitchen so we could talk to Don. Well, Don... Don had two major issues in his life. He wasn't a Christian, and he was a Louisville fan. And I was wor- sometimes more worried about the Louisville. No, I'm kidding. But anyway, so we talked about basketball. And it was like Don was going, what in the world are y'all doing here? And I'm thinking, boy, I sure miss God today. I don't know. I just sense that. We've been there 10, 15 minutes, and their son, Donnie, come out the door. Get that, Donna, Donnie. Don. Donnie's 25 years old, big guy, bigger than Andy, standing in the doorway. He looked at me and he goes, why are you here? I said, Donnie, I really don't know. The Lord led me here tonight. He said, nobody called you to come here? I said, no. I'm thinking, oh boy, he's mad now. He said, Can I, will you come to my bedroom? So now Phyllis is really happy. I've left her with this gruntled Don, and I go in the bed, back in the bedroom with Donnie. And Donnie has a chair in his bedroom, and I sit in the chair, and he sits on the bed, and he goes, nobody called you? I said, nobody called me. He said, uh, how did you know to come here? And I said, I told him a story. We'd gone to houses, prayed. He said, wow. He said, right where you're sitting, I, I knelt about an hour ago. And he said, I asked the Lord to deliver me from alcohol. He said, Brother Tim, I have poured every bottle of alcohol hid in this house down my drain. And I asked the Lord to send somebody by to help. You show up. And that night, Donnie gave his life to Jesus. Donnie's had a struggle. But one of the most beautiful sights I've ever seen was the Sunday that Donnie came forward to make his profession of faith. Donna, his mama, came. And Donnie's daddy came too and gave his life to Jesus. But if I'd missed God that night, what could have happened? Learning to see God in your life. Oh, I've missed him more than I've seen him. I confess that openly. And it breaks my heart. The Lord knows my heart every day. I get up and ask him. I'm seeking. I'm knocking. I'm asking Jesus, help me find people. You're working with. Sometimes I even pray and then I go do. I don't. I do the don't. Or I just ignore them. Or I get busy in life. Who knows? That car salesman might have been one Jesus was working with. Get my picture. Help us to be visionary. 
missionaries, disciples of Jesus.